everybody. What's going on out there? And this is the hashtag. Here they come podcast about your Philadelphia 76ers and they are coming into the second round. Here they come, everybody. Oh, baby, here we go. Now is going to get interesting. Shit has gotten real, Pags, and it is officially time where they need to win or we are going to have ourselves a lot of conversations about this offseason. I want a happy off season, so let's take care of these uh, Canadians. <laughs> the Toronto Raptors, the two seed in the East, face your Philadelphia 76ers, the three seed, which means games one, two, five, and seven will be in the city of Toronto, where hopefully Drake will be sitting courtside so he can fuck up this Toronto team with his juju. Yeah, I can't wait for the back and forth between him and Embiid. It's going to be great. Before we dive into some on-the-court matchups here, Pags, just a brief touch on the schedule. Like we mentioned, in Toronto for games one and two, Saturday, Monday. However, then the the tricky part comes actually in the city of brotherly love. They do have the two days to travel, Monday into Thursday, so Tuesday and Wednesday off. However, then in the same fucking city... They get two days off again for Friday and Saturday, so something must be in the Wells Fargo Center there Saturday night that they couldn't play every other night. That's probably a good thing, considering we need all the rest for Joel's knee that we can get. For sure. I actually feel a little bit better about this series now, knowing that he is going to get these breaks, so hopefully he can play through games one and two and then get these little rest days to uh, get himself back for games three and four. That's it. They go every other Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday down the stretch. Hopefully those games will be needed because, unfortunately, Pags, if uh, people are – thinking it's going to be a quick series. Nobody's saying that in the Sixers' favor. Vegas is heavy on the Raptors. A lot of the experts are heavy on the Raptors. So, hey, we're Philadelphia. We wouldn't want it any other way, right, my man? Well, there's a couple of different numbers that back that up, man, because number one, Kawhi Leonard, wherever the hell he's been, San Antonio or Toronto, is 14-0 and in his career against the Sixers. Never lost. Never lost. 14 big, and 0. Big baller. So that's unbelievable stat in its own right. And then the follow up is the Toronto Raptors apparently are 21 and 3 against Brett Brown led 76ers teams over the course of the regular season. So Toronto has our number, man. We're not walking into a situation where we're feeling really good about ourselves as opposed to last year where. We were rolling, rolled through the first round. We thought Boston going to seven with Milwaukee. We're going to roll through them. And maybe there was a little bit of overconfidence going on. So how do you feel about kind of the mentality and where the players are this time around in regards to the second round and what it's going to take to advance? Well, like you said, it's another year, another year of experience for this Sixers team. Added a couple pieces to uh, help you in this exact situation. I just get very, very concerned about the depth of the Sixers. Like you had said at the end of uh, the game five, Toronto isn't as deep. So the talent on both sides is arguable for sure. And the depth when... We said that in our YouTube podcast. I meant it more so along the lines of like body count because the Nets ran 9, 10, 11 guys out there and the Raptors really limited to eight, kind of like Philadelphia. So it is going to be more of a matchup of the starting five units. And we can get into that now a little bit. The Sixers and Raptors literally in the playoffs have the highest plus minus margin for starting fives. They're one, two. So both of those starting fives dominated in their respective rounds. And that's that's going to be the battle, man. And like we mentioned, we'll touch on it briefly here. Uh, Kawhi Leonard has guarded Ben Simmons, like I mentioned, causing turnovers. And that, I think, may be one of the ultimate keys to the series, Pags, is really how the Sixers counter that with do they let Simmons continue to run the offense or do you take – whoever Kawhi is guarding, whether it's Simmons, Butler, Harris, whoever it may be, and kind of just isolate them in the corner and almost go four on four with the rest of the guys because just take fucking Leonard out of him, and if he's the best defender in basketball, let him go stand in the corner. I would really like 
like it if the Raptors did put Kawhi on Ben Simmons and kind of let the Sixers run the point with Butler. I think our offense would run better that way and let him be battle with Gasol the whole game. I mean, that might be our best chance of winning. We noticed that more and more throughout the Nets series that along with Jimmy Butler, Tobias Harris was getting a lot more of those ball screen possessions I had told you about that he ran a shit ton with the Clippers. I mean, game one, we had Mark Quilling on and he said, hey, what the hell's wrong with him? Well, all of a sudden, games three, four, and five, he's having 20 to 30. Well, what the hell's the difference is they're giving him the ball and letting him run those ball screens. I mean, how many times we yelled at him because he was fading forward on all these jump shots now, but he wasn't even taking shots like that before. And, dude, I'll take a bunny from Harris at the free throw line any fucking day of the week because Simmons can't even shoot that shot. Let another big athletic wing run the pick and roll with Embiid because you have the option to shoot the ball as opposed to Simmons where 100% of the time this is going to the rim. I was listening to a conversation with Keith Pompey with uh, Mikey Miss, and he had talked about how Jimmy made a conscious effort to get Tobias and JJ his looks in games three, four, and five. And I think that is the key for the Sixers to win, is if Tobias and JJ are hitting their shots, they have a very, very good chance It's going to be tough for Toronto to guard all of those people, that's for sure. And I think we may get a little bit of a break from J.J. defensively in this round because it'll be him and Danny Green going at each other. Now, I don't want to take anything away from Danny Green, but I do feel as if he's a little bit more of a shooter as opposed to that slasher type guy that really gives Redick problems. So uh, I don't think we're going to be yelling at J.J. And that's typically the way it's been because if he doesn't score, he ain't fucking doing diddly on you on defense for you. So... Let's hope he shoots the rock well and then can kind of hang with Danny Green. Who do you think is going to be the guy we hate on the Raptors? Because obviously you got Jared Dudley for the Nets. Couldn't fucking stand him. Last year was Marcus Smart with the Celtics and uh, Winslow from the Heat. I was going to say, based on the guys you're describing, I feel like Serge Ibaka has a little bit of a reputation to kind of get things going. Uh, I don't think Marcus Saul is going to back down from Embiid in any way. Those two will probably bang a little bit. Uh, But that's really, I mean, Kyle Lowry potentially, but guard on guard, I don't see him, you know, maybe him and Jimmy Butler going at it a bit. I I just see this one, honestly, man. I think Toronto kind of takes the makeup of Kawhi where it's just all fucking business, like no celebration. We're just going to walk in here, kick your ass, beat you in five, walk out, and you're just going to go, how the hell do they do that? How are they so good? Like, they shouldn't be that good. What the hell does that? Yeah, Yeah. like Kawhi, uh, you know, he's averaged against Philadelphia here, if I have my numbers correctly. Kawhi versus Philly in three games is averaging 30.3 with 7.7 rebounds, four steals, and three assists. He just shows up, drops 38, 4, and 4. Let me name a little dark horse for the Sixers who played well against the Raptors earlier this year. Jonah Bolden put up 25 against the Raptors. Bolden, we see him a little bit more than uh, Boban this uh, series. It's going to be interesting because Jonah's certainly not afraid to shoot the rock. Even when he came in kind of late in the game here, he gives you that three-point look, and Boban gives you that down under. So if they do go small and stretch the floor, that's one of those things where you take the plus-minus of Marcus Gasol's not guarding Bolden out by the three-point line, but I also don't know if Bolden's going to be able to bang with Gasol defensively. So... Depends on your matchups, but you could stretch the floor with Bolden and maybe give a a little bit more looks and go small, so to speak. Maybe even flirt Simmons down to like the four or five if you're going to let, you know, Jimmy Butler kind of take the reins and and run point there. Yeah, I can't see Greg Monroe this season, this series. I just keep him on the bench. As long as Embiid's playing in every game, that is damn sure, man. I don't need to be (laughs) watching him fucking lumber around going left 100 percent of the time. Getting into keys of this series, I think the main glaring key that I feel like we have this conversation all the time with the Sixers, the main key is turning the ball over because the Raptors will cause a lot of turnovers with their defense. And the Sixers are very willing to turn the ball over as we've seen them for the last two years. So if they can take care of the ball, I really think they can make this a series. Absolutely going to be something to watch. And the first question will be uh, Simmons is the main culprit. Do they keep the ball in his hands or do they remove it? And then 
Embiid is probably the second biggest culprit who gets a little bit out of control and can throw the ball away and things like that come crunch time. So we're going to need another big shot from Mike Scott. Uh, we're going to need another big shot from Ennis coming down the stretch, man. At Redick fucking off balance making a three. So ultimately, my prediction, Pags, is I do have the Raptors in seven. I think the Sixers give them a little bit more of a run than some people out there are thinking just based on the numbers and the past events of the Sixers never fucking winning any of these games. So I've given them a little bit of credit to run through. However, I could see them, if they light it up, advancing. But uh, that's not the smart money, man. Smart money's on the team from up north. Yeah, I got six, maybe getting three, two series, game six in Philly, and we're dumping it late in the game and just be heartbroken till next October. That's right, man. But hey, like we saw in round one, let's not overreact on game one, win or lose. Obviously, we can bounce back if we lose it. It's going to be a matter of both teams kind of feeling each other out, which lineups are working, which ones aren't. What adjustment are they making when we do this? And then you kind of find your flow there in two, three, and four. So hopefully, uh, Brett Brown can make the right additions. We got a rookie coach for the Raptors as well, man. So that's a, a plus for us. Is hopefully he doesn't know what the hell he's doing, and Brett can make an adjustment or two and save his job. Yeah, we got to make the Raptors choke. I know Kawhi's there now and Gasol, but those guys on that roster have felt the choking in the last couple years with LeBron. Let's uh. We got to cause them to do that again this series. <laughs> For sure. But anyway, that's the Here They Come podcast, your Philadelphia 76ers postseason podcast available with Too Close to Call. Follow us on all your social media for updated posts, tweets, everything you need to know about the games, whether or not Embiid's going to play, since nobody fucking knows up until tip off. <laughs> Let's just hope that he is healthy and ready to rock. Ready to rock. And here we go, baby. Sixers and seven. Come on. Love it.